Hello, and welcome to part four of the Invader Spec series. Lara Croft, from screen to page. In the many years that Lara Croft has graced our consoles, in the many times we have worked our way through the meandering labyrinths, and through the countless hours we have watched her gather artefacts, conjure demons, and banish the evil, there has always been one thing that has come between Lara and her situation. That one thing is a colon. Just a one tiny dot on top of another. It might be of insignificance to you, but for Lara and the games, the punctuation is a prefix to dividing her world. On one side sits the principles of the game, and on the other sits the personality, the commodity that can be divided from the philosophy and sold, commercialised, left to discover new paths away from the tomb. This side is Lara Croft, the other side is Tomb Raider the game she inhabits, the rules that she abides by. It's a symbiotic relationship. They both inform each other. Design, narrative, mechanics are decided on when considering who Lara is, and Lara's attitude, personality, are being crafted by the world around her. The puzzles she explores and enemies she fights, it works because there are two parts that are both divided yet cohesive. They might be completely different, but I think Lara Croft is only a success and who she truly is when both these sides work to inform each other. And I know this because when you take Lara out of her world in which she was created, dramatic changes begin. To explain more, in truth there are really two sides to Lara Croft. One is informed by the gaming world around her, the other is informed by whatever context she is put in, outside of that which brought her into being. One is the womb, the other is a world open to external variances. In the former, Lara is at home to be, well, Lara. No matter what the developers do with a narrative or direction, essentially sees the same person from one game to another. She fights, climbs, solves puzzles, and still remains to be an archaeologist at heart. In the game, it's the mechanics and design that help inform us of who she is. It's the way she leaps, fights and interacts with puzzles. Her silence and her dialogue all form part not only of the gaming structure, but of who Lara is. The fact that she can only make certain jumps, the way routes and paths are highlighted. These are not development choices or matters of direction. It's Lara, and they are elegant pieces of her personality. Now, when those are all taken away, there is suddenly a space to fill, a space where there was once the mechanics of a puzzle or the artistry of a jump. When these things are not there to guide the development and personality of Lara as a character, other things have to be found that didn't exist before. An internal monologue, characters to help create action and move the story along, history and mythology to make situations credible. All of these need not be present when we play because the way we control Lara and what objectives we complete tell us all we need to know. Her silences speak volumes and we spend more time with her alone than with other characters. However, what is to us in the game when written in a book doesn't look quite so appealing. 
To see then how Lara as a personality and a commodity is used and changed when taken out of the gaming world, I've turned my attention to how she is presented away from the game. For this, I've taken to Lara on the page. I was already familiar with the films, and in all honesty, I never thought they did a crushingly bad job at presenting who Lara is. Helped, of course, by being a visual medium, the films still had the sense of scale, grandeur and might that pervades each of the games. But head to the page, and who Lara is begins to suffer. Now, I don't want this to be a critique on the particular writers of the books I've chosen. This is a critique of the limits of a medium, or indeed how critical the medium is on informing a character. Just like characters on the page struggle to make a transition to the screen, I believe that Lara suffers the same fate when being put into ink. Now, the two books I've read is one written by James Allen Gardner, called The Man of Bronze, and a graphic novel which is the second part of the Lara Croft Tomb Raider series released by Top Cow. Both of the novels, despite being different in form and medium, take Lara drastically away from that which I think informs a large part of her character. They are Tomb Raider by name only, and instead, as the blurb on the back of the graphic novel states, 240 pages of action and classic adventure featuring the legendary Lara Croft, both of these books are without the mystery and intrigue of the game. In between the pages, vast puzzles have a difficulty playing out in front of you, and lose their eminence and power. Enemies are chuckling villains and bosses are without all skill or strategy. In here, there is little of the world that Lara knew. In fact, in parts, she is a completely different person. The third in a series of thrilling adventures, Lara Croft Tomb Raider The Man of Bronze sees a third different author in a row try and capture that which makes Lara a complete person in the game, a complete person on the page. Written before the great exodus to Crystal Dynamics, Man of Bronze comes with all the licenses you could wish from both Eidos and Core Design. Now, before I dive into the book, let me introduce my good friend, Chris. Hello, Samwise. Chris will be a voice you'll get used to in this podcast, as he'll be reading several extracts from the Man of Bronze as we go along. Now... As writing goes, it's unclear how much input Eidos and Core Design had with the actual direction of the novel, whether they just gave James the name and the title and told him to run with it, or they actually had an input into the character and where they think the story should go. However, despite how much input they may have had, as the novel begins, Lara already seems lost in between the page. Star Miastro was levelled during World War II, not a stone left standing, and everything you see is a 20th century reproduction, made to look aged using rubble that was left after Hitler and Stalin pounded the city into ruin. In other words, Star Miastro is a counterfeit antique, well built and lovely, but fake. I know about counterfeits, I have seen many. My name is Lara Croft, and I collect old things. The novel starts with Lara meeting a friend who needs her help, Reuben Baptiste. Now Reuben is killed before he can reveal the mysteries of his plight or what he's running from. Lara discovers that he was working for the Order of the Bronze, which has set up to safeguard a bronze figure who, for want of a better term, has special powers. Lara effectively fills in Reuben's place after his death and goes in search of the leg of the bronze man. Now, as a plot, it's not that far away from something that might be cooked up by the team behind the game. It's full of enough excuses for fetch quests, world travelling and enough plight and tension for action. It's not a world away from the outlandish narrative found in, for example, the original Tomb Raider and Underworld. However, as this extract shows us, the biggest shift and the biggest difficulty for the reader is the change in perspective. The games are all in third person. The book is in the first, and for this, it suffers. A character, who in the game is informed by the several feet of distance that we keep from her, 
someone who herself makes an effort to distance those around her for fear of losing them like she did her parents. Now we are in a far more intimate position with Lara. We can hear her thoughts, we can witness her beliefs. So it's with this change of perspective that we become a lot more critical of who Lara is as a character. Therefore, we're a lot more likely to dislike her or disagree with what she's saying. It seems strange that in this extract, that when referring to who she is and what she does as collecting old things, it just seems like an odd thing for her to say. It doesn't feel right. And given that the perspective is now in the first person, and this book has all the licenses from the people who've made the game, who is to say that our perception has been wrong all the time, considering we've never had access to these thoughts before? Collecting old things is, yes, essentially what Lara does. But the Lara you see in any of the Tomb Raider games has a passion for that which has now passed on. I believe that it's not necessarily the old, but more the forgotten. Things and places that have been forgotten about for other virtues. To me, Lara sees age not as a precursor for carrying out her adventures, but instead sees it as a part of her life, a simple consequence of time. We know that in the games Lara is straight and matter of fact, but her adoration with the past and discovery is beyond collection and time. So why is it that the author felt that this was the right thing for her to say? For me, it starts with the stilted historic way he gets Lara to think about the city. In the game, Lara is shown to appreciate architecture, but she's never adverse to ripping down sections to gain further access or drive forklifts into crypts. Her playful relationship with history and buildings in the games lets us know that she has an appreciation for history, but her passion for truth and discovery go far beyond the facts and the facade. Therefore, I know that she considers what she does much more than collecting old things. Again, I don't want to critique the writer, as he has the hardest job of all. Here on the page, Lara is a different character to how we know her, because the writer has had to create a perpetual dialogue with the reader. Instead of the visual cues in game, the movie and graphic novels, here on the page, the person who Lara is, is exposed more than in any of the titles, films or sketches. In part of the graphic novel written by Dan Jurgens, there is a section when a former lover of Lara's, Chase, who went on to betray her, dies after inhaling an ancient but toxic smoke. In his dying moments, Lara doesn't say a word. She has several thoughts, but even these are kept to a minimum. The mixture of perspective that the graphic novel gives us works because the beautiful artistry of the sketchwork allows her to bury her former lover in silence. And that's a lot closer to how we see Lara in the game. However, in the book, hearing her voice as a constant when we have been used to her in silence is a shock, and of course it's bound to cause a clash in how we have perceived Lara as a character after all these years. My current employer has deep pockets and gives me a huge expense account, so I'd splurged on something fast, sleek and sporty. A Lamborghini Diablo. My eyebrows went up. You can rent a Lamborghini Diablo? Dear, oh dear, whatever happened to exclusivity? I resolved to sell my own Diablo before people thought I'd gone bargain hunting at Hertz. Yes, some things just don't sound like they would come out of Lara's mouth. I wanted to reassure him, pat his shoulder or even give him a hug, tell him I understood. But I couldn't force myself past the restraint of my upbringing. Lara! Dear one, mustn't intrude. However much one feels, one really mustn't intrude. But then some things do. Even in this book, there is a strange divide in how Lara is portrayed. 
You know, on one side, she is almost chauvinistic. And though she displays and sometimes talks of wealth in the game, this is external and never really internal. In the game, the outward presentation of money shows us how much Lara disregards it almost and uses it only as a material. But because her thoughts are internalised here in the book, suddenly the thought to trade in a car because it's available to rent feels almost caustic. They wore the sort of black-on-black ski mask and Kevlar outfits that had become mandatory for hoodlums with no fashion sense. Where do they buy these clothes? From some charity shop that gets hand-me-downs and Hollywood B-movies? Just once I'd like to face gunmen decked out in tuxedos. Or cashmere. I heard the screams, he said. Glad to hear they came from the Shadow Man rather than you. What did you do? I enlightened him, I said, then regretted it. As a peer of the realm... I should hold myself to higher standards than bad movie gag lines. The author is obviously doing all this to show Lara's relationship with her wealth, that to some she has to appear like the wealthy lady that she was brought up. Money is just part of her persona, something that she's happy to exploit and use to her advantage. In the games you are aware that she has money, but it's strange to think that she would ever become concerned about exclusivity on a possession which does not hold any of the virtues of the relics and items she is so passionate about hunting. There is a strange thing at work in the books. The personality of Lara seems to have been lost when transferred to the page, but her subtleties, that which you see in the game, remain. For example, her references to her father when juxtaposed with this predisposition for wealth, become poignant and delicate. This reference to her father is something that certainly reflects the Lara we see in the game. In fact, her parents are probably two of the triggers that cause Lara to ever externalise much emotion. Her father is a force that pushes Lara, and still has the greatest effect on how she is developed and changed. Her mother, in legend, becomes a force strong enough to kill for. In the game's books and films, Lara's father is a power behind much of pretty much all she does. Anniversary hints of his unfinished work, and in the Man of Bronze, her father has changed her entire attitude. As I snatched up the leg and ran, I thought ten years ago I would have tried to wrestle the big lug. Five years ago, I would have played the sex kitten card. I grinned. Thank heavens now I'm mature. Now, one of the most controversial parts of Lara's presentation in the game has always been her figure and sexuality. Her well-endowed physique and a want to look good is something that both the graphic novel and the book don't ignore. I doubted if any of the commandos could even fit in the shaft of the vault. They were big, tough men, substantially larger than the average Carthagian circa 146 BC. Even I might find the going snug. And please, no churlish comments about my personal proportions. In the game, her figure and sexuality have never been things to come between the player and Lara. They are never decisive factors to exploring certain areas either. Lara uses her body and sexuality to get what she wants, but here in the book, it becomes a distraction. This is something that is even more so in the graphic novel. Here, Lara is a character with an ever-changing wardrobe. Each one accentuates her figure and her breasts. It borders on the caricature, and here in this world of the graphic novel presented like this, Lara feels more apart from her gaming life than ever before. There are characters who spy on her while she's bathing, and others who dress her in tight cotton gowns while she sleeps. Some would say that this is not far away from, for example, the bikini bonus costumes of some Tomb Raider titles, or the titillation of the black dress in Legend. However, as legend proves, her dress sense is one of practicality and not necessarily of sexuality. Outside of the games, Lara has been presented as a sexual figure, but inside the games she almost becomes an androgynous figure. The book mentions her breasts almost as fan service, and in a way the graphic novel makes such a fuss about her dress sense is because without the isolated nature of her work in the games, Without the puzzles focusing attention on the mind, they can't ignore Lara as a figure and as a body. The wealth of characters that are introduced in the graphic novel as well, well, there are more people there to mention it. Because in both the book and the graphic novel, Lara is no longer inaccessible and isolated. (laughs) 
Lara's presentation in both of the books does show us though that there is one thing other than the narrative and her parental relationships that permeates through much of how Lara is presented away from Tomb Raider. This is her determination. Unless, Father Emil said, you can retrieve the items first, Miss Croft. I came close to punching Father Emil in the face. I'd been in this position many times. A map stolen, a treasure to be found before the forces of evil got hold of the mystic MacGuffin. Please, Miss Croft, sign up with us and save the world. I didn't want to save the world. I just wanted to do something to Reuben. This was not about vengeance. This was not about venting my anger or getting closure. This was not even about making the villains pay in some suitable way for their crimes. I'd gone down the road of retribution often enough to realize it was a dead end. It eased no pain. It restored no balance. It righted no wrongs. Reuben would remain dead, whatever happened to his killers. Only fools believed in evening the score. I'd been such a fool more than once, but I was trying to get past it. Before she's portrayed by Chase in the graphic novel, all Lara is concerned with is hunting down treasure. After Chase's death, she does not speak for several pages, determined to carry out his last will and testament. Both the authors have presented this superbly because it's the most overt part of the whole gaming mechanic. You're not going to complete a Tomb Raider game unless you have the resolute mind to do it. The story could be top notch, the graphics wonderful, but if you're going to go ahead and make it from A to B, you need determination. The levels are designed to test you. The puzzles are encouragements for rage and Lara is informed by each and every part of this. It is something that the writers could not and have not missed about Lara. Her passion for discovery and invention are the bread and butter of the title. It's no wonder really that this is permeated through into the novels. Admittedly, it works better in the game because you share Lara's level of determination. But... As I read both the graphic novel and the book, this was the part that most rang true and told me that maybe Lara can exist outside of the tomb. Lara is always going to be bigger than the games themselves. This is no fault of her own. But instead of a hefty marketing campaign and a lot of effort to promote her before the Tomb Raider games themselves. She became separated from the titles and they no longer had a place for some to inform who she was. For me though, and from reading the books, it's within the game that really tells us who Lara is. You take her out of the architecture, out of the rooms laden with traps or the boats full of enemies and you lose who Lara really is. She is defined by not only the perspective by which you play the games, but the environments themselves. Every yelp of frustration when we just about cling to a ledge. Every twist and jump whilst we avoid the velociraptors hint at years of training and conditioning. The grandeur of the puzzles and their scale contextualise who Lara is in the presence of history. And her silence within all this speaks volumes. Lara Croft and Tomb Raider are one of the same and she'll never be who she really is until the next time you pick up the controller. next week on In Spect, the four of us return as we discuss what impact the game has had and what we think of where it's going. This is a new type of game. We've got more opportunities now and we can hit a bigger audience. We're not limited to make these games. We're not limited to this small community of hardcore gamers who appreciate what we're doing. This allows us to really spread our wings and let everybody enjoy this type of game. Yeah. And I think that's probably one of the biggest things that Tomb Raider did was bring in a much bigger audience to this type of game. 
That's all to come on the final part of Enraider Spect.